and welcome to the CineGrid Community Forum in October. Uh, <clears throat> and CineGrid Community Forum is a monthly online session at the intersection of media and AI. Uh, we've had uh, been running these sessions since uh, February of 2021. And we've had a, a series of really expert presentations. We've talked about the Nautilus distributed supercomputer and the approach to potluck supercomputing. And we've looked more deeply at the tools and architecture of that uh, cyber infrastructure. Uh, we had a presentation from Angus Forbes on the faculty at UC Santa Cruz about AI and creativity, especially in the graphic arts. Kunitake Kaneko, our colleague from Keio University, gave a presentation about the graphs system for next generation networks. Uh, Jason Lee and Luke Renembo gave a, the world premiere of the not yet ready Sage 3 prototypes and talked about AI for remote collaboration, which actually stimulated the, was the impetus for today's talk. We had a very, um, I could say, microscopic presentation and microscopic detail about uh, imaging technology for uh, electron microscopes and the computer architectures and software workflow necessary to pull secrets out of this imaging data for medical research. Alvi Ray Smith gave us a presentation on his new book, A Biography of the Pixel, uh, three days after it was published. And uh, last month, we had a presentation uh, about how AI is transforming mo moving picture restoration from the folks at Algosoft. Um, again, all as just as Jeff said, all of these are posted to the Cinegrid archives on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and uh, search on Cinegrid uh, forum archives, I think, um, and Greg will, uh, Jeff will also send a link. Uh, we have one more presentation this calendar year on December 7th and 8th. Uh, Brian Hansen at uh, UC Santa Cruz will give a talk about AI generated sound effects for gaming and movies. And uh, the calendar for 2022 is to be announced. Uh, this is today's agenda. Uh, I'm doing, giving the introduction right now. It's a very simple agenda. Uh, today's presentation is Next Generation Remote Collaboration, Distance Learning, and Hybrid Workspaces from my friend and colleague and all of our favorite, all of our, uh, favorite uh, gadget man, uh, Greg Harper, who is president of Harper Vision, his own firm for many years, and for the last few years, also been vice president for infrastructure at Shorelight Education. Uh, as many people around the world have learned from personal experience during the pandemic, you know, remote collaboration, even with fast networks, big screens, and good sound, is not ideal. Yet the continuing necessity of remote instruction and remote interaction and remote collaboration is with us. We thought it was going to be just a short-term thing, but here we are 18, 20 months into it. And from what I can tell, as a just as a citizen, it looks like it's going to be going more remote. Uh, uh, tell everything. Greg Harper is a longtime Cinegrid collaborator, and he'll share today his perspective on the challenges of next generation remote collaboration, distance learning, and hybrid workspaces. Drawing on his many decades of experience designing and implementing television studios, performance spaces, executive conference rooms, and enterprise telecollaboration for some of the biggest banks, corporations, and educational institutions in America and overseas. And I'd like to ask Greg to explain to us his views and give us a tour of his lab. And with that, I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to Greg and uh, off you go. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and good to see all of you here. And uh, so I'm talking to you from uh, my lab in New York City at uh, the Gateway Center, which is actually at the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce. Um, so um, they, uh, it's a not-for-profit. Uh, we have a lovely location here in Mid Midtown Manhattan on the 29th floor with views of the entire city. Um, and it's a wonderful space for me to test things out and to give the benefit of the chamber. But it also gives me the advantage of looking to a number of um, uh, Nordic companies that are here. Uh, so it's a real collaboration situation. Uh, I'm in talking to you from my lab, uh, but I'll go around and show you some of the other spaces. 
Uh, we did this last night, and last night uh, there was I was here by myself. Uh, today there are other people here in the in the space, uh, so I'll have to navigate around them. But uh, hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. So let me first uh, switch over to my slides and uh, make sure that you can uh, see them, uh, which hopefully now is happening. And I would ask everybody to please go into speaker mode on your Zoom window. Please select speaker mode so you can get the full experience. Thank you. Okay. So uh, according to my system here, it says uh, screen sharing is enabled. So theoretically you're seeing this. Uh, so as uh, Lauren mentioned, uh, my name is Greg Harper. Um, I've been doing stuff uh, in the collaborative space since the, my word, uh, the late 70s um, into the 80s, interactive television, uh, early, early looks at uh, 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 teletext, video text, you remember all of that, data broadcasting, um, and then uh, got involved in interactive television, have a number of patents in that area. Uh, so I've been playing in the space for quite a bit, and I was a TV producer for many years, producing shows both here and in the United States, in the United States and in Europe. I, I grew up in France and uh, spent a lot of my time commuting between Paris and New York for a while. Uh, so moving right along, um, the uh, topic that uh, we wanted to talk about today uh, is um, uh, the grand challenges. Um, and I've come to learn over the years that the challenges are no longer technical. Uh, they really are human centric. Um, and uh, I've learned that we can be sitting there and come up with the greatest, fanciest system in the world. But if we don't take a look at how people interact with it, the experiential design, uh, which goes to the architecture, to the furniture, to the audio, to the environment, um, it, we're going to be we're going to fail. And I've done this for large banks. I've done this for small universities. I've done this for large universities. I've done this for being large, large companies. But at the end of the day, what it all boils down to is um, that we really have to focus on the human -ish aspects of what we're trying to accomplish. So uh, first example, and um, uh, I worked with a major international bank. Um, that had built a state-of-the-art AV conference room uh, for senior management. And when I say state-of-the-art, no, no money was spared on this. It Multiple cameras, all high definition, uh, and it technically worked flawlessly. But yet when we were about to move uh, to a new building, um, new corporate headquarters, um, we talked to the users and they said, you know, your room doesn't work. And I what do you mean your room doesn't work? Uh, technically, trust me, if there had been a slightest glitch, the phones would have rung off the, off the hook. Um, so we knew it worked technically. It didn't work for them as a meeting. And it didn't work for them as a meeting because they said, look, we are in a, um, we're, we're doing a meeting here. We're not doing a television show. Um, and um, when, when you're trying to do, when you, when you're trying to do a meeting here and uh, what's up, oh my, there we go. What they were really saying was that the space uh, may work technically, but it, it didn't work for their name. They wanted to collaborate. And I learned very quickly after attending some of these meetings that the last person they actually wanted to see was the person giving the presentation. What they were looking for is all the other people in the room. They're looking for the reactions, et cetera. Now, mind you, this was super high level of a very large bank. Uh, so these guys are class A poker players. They really are looking around. They're making billion dollar decisions. They really, they know all the data. They know all the information. What they don't know is how their other colleagues are interpreting it. They don't know how that's happening. And so we learned very quickly that um, it was the environment of the space that made more important, it was more important than the, um, than the technology in it. Now, of course, we did put in good technology and actually thanks to Cinegrid, uh, where I learned about some of the technology that advances there, uh, we used some uh, information we got out of Cinegrid. Um, so um, this is a photo and I normally cannot show you photos, but it just so happens that um, uh, the CEO tweeted this picture. Uh, now, this is not exactly how the room is used normally. This is in the Zoom configuration. Um, but what you're gonna, what you're seeing is a similar, is a half uh, circle uh, and a, that's a 30 foot wall. Uh, that is a uh, eight, it's um, uh, 12K uh, video wall, uh, 12K resolution. Uh, it has fixed cameras. By the way, this was circa 2008, okay? Now the cameras didn't exist. The projection system didn't exist. The codex didn't exist. The audio didn't exist. We had to build it off from scratch, literally going to Japan and building the cameras, bringing imaging chips and having Astro Design build them for us. Um, but 
we learn very quickly. Now, normally when this is used, what you don't see this Hollywood squares up there. What you normally see is the people at the other end of the room, which we have identical rooms in uh, other cities. So what they're seeing is a big round table. And what is missing here is the other, the other piece of that, of those rooms. So in London, there was a, another third and in Hong Kong, there's, and Tokyo is another third, et cetera. All the same architecture, all the same chairs, all the same table, all the same screen. So that it looked like we're all around. And if you're sitting in the chair there, now that's opened up for social distancing, but if you're sitting in the chair and you're looking at the person on the screen, the person sitting at the far left table, camera position, uh, seating position is the exact same size as the person on the screen uh, from the remote location. So we took the end number of people, which is, you know, somewhere, somewhere under 30. Um, and we made sure that everybody had a seat at the table, either physically or virtually. And so the London experience just saw they saw the New York people, the New York people saw the London people and so on and so forth. In this particular case, we're using it for Zoom. Um, we learned very quickly that the switching uh, had to happen in your, in your head. Uh, they didn't want some algorithm. They didn't want some data system to switch. They wanted to switch based on what they're interested in. And so therefore, it was very important that we could hear them and see them. So to hear them, it's a high quality spatial audio system, uh, Meyer sound for speakers. Uh, we use, as you can see, there are table mics on this system here. But we also made very, we spent a lot of time building the uh, surround uh, or spatial audio so that whoever spoke, the audio came from that person or if they chuckled or whatever, you could hear it. Uh, multiple channels of audio going across the, across the pond. Um, we also took out the mute button, which everybody, all the AV guys said, you can't do that. We have to have a mute button. I went, not in a meeting, you don't. If you're in a real meeting, you don't have mute buttons. So there is no mute button. They can't mute. They're all in the meeting. You're in there, you're not in there. It's always, by the way, always on. Um, in this particular case, you're seeing it on with a Zoom call. So that's not always on. But the normal mode when it's connected to the other locations, it's always on. And it's been on, by the way, since 2010. Um, and uh, so now it's uh, 12 years and it's finally coming to the end of its life. Uh, so we've had to have to rebuild it. Um, uh, the, the Sony won't support some of the products anymore. Um, but matching rooms and architecture, where I learned a lot. Lighting's important, resolution is important, frame rate. Uh, we ran this at a high frame rate because when we saw high frame rate, we could get better facial expressions um, and super high resolution. So uh, that led us to, uh, uh, when I finished with that project, I, I did the same thing for another two banks, uh, not quite the same level. Uh, but then I was approached by a company called Shorelight Education. And Shorelight uh, is in partnership with about 27 US universities. And they wanted to provide a degree program uh, for students who could not come physically to the US. Uh, so what they do is they normally facilitate foreign students coming into the United States, uh, helping them uh, navigate uh, what the American education system is all about. And they go through their pro program and they were successful and they graduated. They went back to their home country and then they wanted a master's degree or they wanted to continue education. And they found out that, well, they couldn't really get on the plane and fly over because they had families, they had jobs, et cetera. So they wanted to have the ability to have the U.S. education without actually having physically come. But we also needed to provide a service. The universities were insisting on this. It had to be as good as if they were in the classroom. So we spent a little bit of time thinking about this. And this is all pre-COVID, by the way. It's been going on for about five years. And we prototyped the first system at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And uh, we've since uh, rolled it out to a number of other universities. And at this point, uh, Jeff, uh, I will uh, stop sharing and ask you if you could uh, play a short video uh, which is a, it's a marketing video, but it'll give you an idea of what's happening and then I'll go into more detail. Sure, Greg, I'll, I'll grab that screen share and load that for you right now. Better teaching and learning in a connected digital classroom. So this is an illustration of a network graph with nodes. Live classes. And links. Even though the instructor is in the US, and the students are halfway around the world, gathered together in multiple supervised classrooms. What a cost might be to get from one node Students to speak and are spoken to. Anyone. Delay? Delay. Delay is a great example. Shiran, we haven't heard from you in a while. What causes delay? Lots of things. Bandwidth, for one. That's exactly right, Shuran. You did your homework. Hey, I always do my homework. Oh, well, <laughs> glad you did it this time. The instructor is always visible. So are the slides. 
both in front of the room and on students' desktops. With language support, interactive whiteboards connect everyone electronically. Students can raise their hand virtually without interrupting. The instructor sees immediately. Cameras provide close-up views of every student. Polls survey the class instantly, and the results are displayed graphically. Deep group discussions are orchestrated by the instructor. Students submit their answers as text or as virtual flip charts. Very For us, distance is not a barrier. It's an opportunity. Okay, back to you, Greg. Okay. So sorry for the uh, the marketing uh, thing here. Um, it's always uh, it's always fun to uh, have to deal with some marketing uh, thing here. But uh, and of course now my mouse has decided not to uh, react, and uh, that's no fun. Here we go. Hopefully, uh, okay. And where are we here? Slideshow and share. So theoretically, you're now seeing my slide. Um, okay. So let me get into a little more detail about what this is all about, because I know there are a lot of educators on the phone, uh, on, the, uh, on the line here. And so you probably want to know beyond the marketing uh, uh, piece. Uh, I thought the marketing piece at least give you an idea of what we're talking about. So first of all, uh, the studios are uh, only the professors in the studio. Uh, he or she uh, goes into a studio and uh, we wanted to make sure it was just like walking into a normal classroom in teaching. We wanted to make an individual studio because we did not want the have and have nots. We did not want to have the people that were in a classroom different from the people that were um, in the remote. So everybody is remote in this case, even if the professor is teaching a class with some students on campus, they are all watching it remotely. So it's an equal experience. Um, no, no wireless microphones, no, nothing to put on. Uh, most of these professors show up in the classroom 30 seconds before the class, walk in and start doing it. We've built a system um, which we call um, U-Commons, where we bring the entire lesson plan into it and uh, it automatically knows where you are, brings all the slides up and automatically brings the enrollment and we now know where all the students are. The students are organized into uh, cohorts, um, even if they're, we, we, we learn very quickly that when you have a class of more than 20 some people, um, the professor starts moving into lecture mode and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to be into the more of a seminar mode. So we break it up into groups of 20 or thereabouts. It, it's that summer 15, summer 25, but it's, it's relatively small. So for example, in Shanghai, uh, in this one, one particular course, we had like 60 some people. Uh, so we actually split the group into two, two different classrooms on two different floors. Um, the professor has uh, a number of screens at his disposal. Uh, in this case, Brian has got on his right here, he's got a whiteboard. Uh, it's an interactive whiteboard. It's totally interactive. So everybody, the students, uh, the professor, and uh, any classroom has the ability to go up there and write and annotate and interact with it. Uh, the screen to the left is the information, which is whatever um, uh, is being the lesson plan being presented. And on the far left, uh, that's what we call the reference monitor. That's where uh, any notes might show up. That's where uh, other, other app things that are being moved over and they can just drag them over to the other screen. Uh, hard to see, but in the console that's in front of the, uh, behind uh, Brian's uh, back there, uh, there is another touch screen and that's where Commons is. And that's where he sees the entire plan. He also sees thumbnails of each classroom. Uh, so he can see if there are five classrooms involved in the class, he'll see five classrooms. We, by the way, keep those thumbnails, they're wide shots, so they can see what's happening in the class, but they are not at full frame rate because we didn't want to distract them by looking at full frame rate. So they're actually at five frames. They're motion JPEGs that just keep on re repeating every five seconds. Uh, there's a reference monitor on there, the little black thing, uh, document camera, and of course the ability, that red cable, they plug in their laptop, although they can do it wirelessly, et cetera. So they have all those capabilities doing things. It's auto set up. In other words, professor walks in and uh, she walks in. Uh, the system knows that the professor is there. 
Uh, the console is uh, on a pneumatic uh, or electric uh, height, so it'll actually go to the proper height. So does the teleprompter it'll go to the proper height, so we don't have anybody, you know, a short person versus a tall person. Um, it automatically goes to the lesson exactly to where they left off. So if they were in lesson 12 and they got halfway through the lesson, when they come back in, it will be right there. Everything will be queued up, all the slides, all the polls, all the graphics, all the everything will all be tied in. All that runs on AWS. And uh, from the student's perspective, they walk into the classroom, they, they log into their computer, tablet, phone, whatever it is to see their program. And they will then get their homework assignments and other things of that nature on it. They'll also see the lesson plan. And with that, um, they will also, if they're in a physical classroom, they'll be said, oh, we see you're in a physical classroom. Uh, last time you were seating in this seat, uh, are you still seated there? And if you say yes, that's fine. And we found out, by the way, they always sit in the same place. Uh, but if they don't, they'd hit tap a little map of the classroom and it tells them, it automatically tells the camera where they're sitting. Um, there is no, as I said, no lav mic. It's all sen it's high end Sennheiser microphones on the ceiling, all run in the QSC uh, auto, uh, auto uh, mixing solution. Um, we actually have. Uh, Rodrigo, who uh, uh, did the audio design for me, uh, he does other little minor things like the US Congress, the Senate, the House, uh, the National Institutes of Health and other local things. So he's really a really high quality, uh, in addition to the banks, uh, he's a really high quality audio engineer that made a huge difference. Um, the camera is in the teleprompter, which I'll show you in a second. Um, it's auto tracking and auto framing. In other words, the camera is a, uh, it's in there, it's, uh, there's, a video out coming out to it, which is HDSDI, but there's also a stream video that goes into a computer with a graphics card. Hard to get the graphic cards these days, as you know, but uh, goes into a graphics card and we then do an image analysis on the person. So we can do it by facial recognition. Uh, we can actually recognize the professor or we can do it by body recognition. So some professors uh, don't wanna be recognized by the camera for privacy reasons, in which case we just follow their body. On the other, other hand, we have a number of people uh, that do like it because they have other people coming in, the camera will track and pan, actually works better than the, um, than the, than the um, uh, camera operator, which we used originally. Um, the, uh, the system is set up in such a way that uh, in the classroom, in, in, the, in the studio, you really don't need anybody to be there. It all auto, auto starts up. It's all remotely managed. Uh, our head of studios is typically traveling all over the place. He lives in Florida. Uh, so he runs the studios from wherever he is if he needs to. We, have, we do have a teaching assistant there to open the door, unlock the door, make sure the lights are on, that type of thing. But even that we can control remotely. Um, so in the many cases, uh, if the teaching assistant is not there, it doesn't matter. A professor can come in and knows how to do it, walks in and touches. Uh, training for the professor took all of uh, two minutes, three minutes. And they realize, okay, here's the whiteboard. Here's the do. Here are my slides. Got a clicker. Got it done. Thank you very much. And they got the program together. So um, the uh, back to the psychology business, because we really learned that the it was important to, um, oh, this, is what, uh, this is what the classroom looks like first. Um, so uh, the classroom at the top, uh, that one looks like it's in Doha. The bottom right is that that's using projectors, as is the one on the far bottom right. That's a Shanghai classroom uh, with Yadi uh, teaching about uh, header insertion exploit. OK, I guess it must be a security program uh, down below. This is that's in India. Um, and uh, those we've moved from uh, ultra short throw projectors to touch screens. Those are 86 inch ViewSonic interactive touch screens. Uh, we were able to get the price down to the point where it made sense to do it. But those what those projectors that they're projecting against a dot pattern and they will work. You can actually use a digital pen and you can write on them uh, and it will. So they are interactive uh, in the sense of they're there. Uh, every classroom has um, uh, three cameras in it. Uh, there is a QSC uh, PTZ camera in the front of the class and that camera automatically will zoom in to whoever is asking a question about more about that in a second. There is another wide camera, which gives you that wide shot for the thumbnail and a third camera in the back, which is used for student presentations and for proctoring. Uh, all of these are remotely controlled. So as you can see, the professor is always in the middle screen, uh, full screen, uh, designed to be at life size. Um, and that's what the camera auto tracking is doing. So if a student were to ask a question, they would ask, they could raise their hand and the professor would, could see that. But in most cases, what they do is they press their hand raise button on uh, their phone, on their computer. And that automatically uh, brings up uh, in the teleprompter. Uh, and I'll show you the screen in a second. Uh, 
we really wanted eye contact. We really wanted everybody in the classroom uh, to be looking at the professor and the professor looking at them. Now, obviously, if you have 100 students, you can't put 100 people on the teleprompter. So there's all kinds of AI and switching that automatically switches based on activity in the classroom. So the professor gets an idea of what's in there, uh, typically looking at a group shot. But when someone asks a question, then it, it changes. So the prompter, it's a 60 inch teleprompter, um, uh, speakers in the front of them. Uh, this is that this looks like, I think that uh, that's in Boston. It's just a regular classroom. We added a window to it. Uh, but other than that, it's a just plain old classroom. Um, the prompter is in its self-contained thing. It's also on a motorized lift and the camera is in behind that, uh, that black. Hey, Trish. So, um, the uh, so here's the prompter, and this this is this is kind of an important thing. So we key in the bottom when some, when a student presses their button to say I'd like to ask a question, a little thumbnail pops up, and uh, obviously there's room. There's only one in this particular picture. There's only one, so you can see the thumbnail, the arrow pointing to it, it has a picture of the student. It has their name and the pronunciation of how to pronounce them because they're a lot, lot of foreign students. And if you look carefully, you'll see in the right-hand corner of that little thumbnail, uh, there is a green, yellow, and red bar. Uh, those are indicators to the professor, indicating did they do their homework, uh, because it's all tied into UCommons. Um, have, what's their class participation and how are they doing in the class? Not a nestle grade, but a general concept because we have to work for, you know, with privacy issues, et cetera. But it, it basically gives an idea of the professor. So if they see someone that's doing a lot of class participation, someone who's not, the professor may choose to ask someone who's not. And so he has a chance of, of knowing who these students are. Of course, like in any, any, any class, especially at the master's degree level, you know, the professor attempts to know the students. So he, this is a helpful thing. Interestingly enough, when we uh, showed them this, uh, a lot of professors said, well, can I have that in my classroom and regular classroom? <laughs> how, how, how can you do the same thing? Um, so when they're looking at a shot, they're seeing that the professor is seeing the wide shot. So in this particular case, they're looking at the classroom in Beijing and uh, they see the students. And uh, then one of the students asks a question and then the prompter goes to a tight shot of that. The way that works is because we know where the people are sitting, when they came in, we asked them where they sat, uh, if, they hadn't ch if they changed their mode, we've mapped the classrooms, we know where it is. And we send a command to the camera to zoom into that person and switch the command the, the image on the screen. Of course, what about the other students in the other classrooms? So in those classrooms, what happens is the professor is still full screen, but then we put a picture in picture of the student asking the question from one of the other classrooms. And of course, this repeats if there's another, another student coming in. And um, these students are also all popping up on his uh, console, um, on Brian's console, that would, which you see down below uh, there. He has a console there and he can uh, see all the students asking questions. He can toggle between them and switch between them as he needs to or he can switch the classroom, or he can open it up to other questions. He has some commands. So there's an automatic mode, but there's also a manual mode if he wants to override. We learned very quickly that that, um, that virtual hand raise and the ability to uh, put on a one-to-one -one dialogue was critical. That made all the difference. When we did a, an assessment of the courses afterwards, uh, we hired a third party company to come in and analyze, talk to both professors and the students. And I was worried about what was gonna happen to the first test. And you know, at the beginning, it wasn't quite as refined as it is now. And um, when it came back, there were no comments about the technology. Everybody just accepted it. It was, uh, they, they, they didn't like the grading, they didn't like the exams, they didn't like testing, but nobody said anything about the, about the technology. And to really bring it into a factor, I was in Shanghai and um, we were doing a class and uh, Yadi, the professor you saw on the other thing, was doing a class. And uh, he said, he, 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 his class, it was a Monday. And he said, okay, I'll see you on Wednesday. And everybody said, bye. And, you know, just normal dialogue. And he would have a little dialogue with the class every day. What they didn't know was Yadi left the studio at Amherst and hopped on a plane and flew to Shanghai. And uh, so while uh, the, the next day, uh, they in the, in the classroom, they, they, the system is up and they see the, the studio and there's no Yachty. And they're going, where's the professor? You know, is he late? You know, like what's going on here? And um, next thing you know, he walks in the door physically. And their reaction was like, whoa, Yachty, what, professor, yeah, professor, you know, what are you doing here? And uh, Yachty said, oh, you know, a little whole thing. And he had a, there was probably about a 15 to 30 second worth of surprise. And then they went right back into the exact same class. The fact that he was physically there or remote made no difference at all. Um, it was really amazing. 
Of course, there are office hours and other things like that, which we all do as well. Uh, but it's all tied into the same program. So he was on because his whole lesson plan was in U Commons. He could just go to a, a, a laptop there, start it off, and off he goes running everything. And he was running it from the classroom. Uh, so it's uh, really uh, worked out uh, extremely well, and we were very pleased with it. Uh, professors, as I said, when we asked them what they liked about it and didn't like about it, they loved the fact that they could walk in there and do it themselves. They loved the fact they didn't have to put microphones on, they have to worry about wireless microphones. They loved the fact they have to put makeup on or anything else. And they also ultimately really liked being in the studio by themselves uh, because they weren't trying to juggle a in-person class or not. So it was just one thing they were juggling. All the students were there and they felt they actually had a better interaction with the students when they're doing it from the studio than they were in the classroom which was actually very interesting. Um, uh, so uh, we have now, uh, that, that first studio was at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We built a second one there. Uh, third one is on, underway right now. We then added some more uh, at UMass in Boston. Um, then moving east, uh, moving west, uh, the next one, we did, it's not in the order, but we also have some at State University of New York at SUNY. Uh, we have um, a system at John Hopkins uh, we have a system at uh, University of South Carolina, uh, Stanford, and Berkeley. Uh, and uh, then the pandemic hit, and so those things got slowed down. So we quickly pivoted to home studios with a lot of the same thing, which are basically, um, uh, we, we try to recreate the whole thing into a, uh, the teleprompter into a 23-inch uh, touchscreen, uh, touchscreen computer. And we rolled out a couple hundred of those to the professors during the pandemic. Uh, we're since bringing them back. We still have probably 30 or 40 out there, um, but they're now starting to use the studios again. And we'll be building some more studios. So um, that's sort of the education side and I'll take some questions afterwards, but later. But learning from what I learned at the bank and the whole experience of the uh, ex uh, of having high contact and high resolution and high bit rates. Um, uh, also uh, looking at what worked in uh, for Shorelight, um, I started asking a question, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, re remote collaboration is happening no matter what happens. Uh, I, I believe we've, we always predicted this was going to happen. It might take 10 years. It happened in 10 weeks, but uh, uh, we've all now are perfectly comfortable doing what we're doing like right now. But how do you, how do you maintain, how do you get those same capabilities that we, we built for the bank and that we built for uh, Shorelight? How do we do this on a regular ongoing basis? And, uh, you know, building a culture and a team, it happens day by day over the years. And now all of a sudden we're forced into it. But I've noticed that I now work on a team and I have members of the team that are in Los Angeles, they're in the middle of the United States in Ohio, others are in the UK, uh, others are in Connecticut, New Jersey, and we meet every single day, multiple hours a time. Uh, and uh, that team is working to get cohesively together. We all do it on Zoom. We mandate everybody has to have their camera on. We, 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 we frown if you don't put your camera on. Um, and uh, we're all on Zoom. Um, but we've now building that same collaboration that's happening. Uh, so it's happening, but this is a technical group. This is not a, this is not business users. So uh, we're all individually screened, but now what happens when some people come back to the office and other people are, are still remote? Uh, and how do we make that work together? And how do we solve for the hybrid work? So that is a challenge that I have been working on. And when I looked at um, uh, the movie, since in a grid has uh, cinema in it, I just rather than grab some random pictures, I, I grabbed some scenes of movies. And notice in all of these scenes, there's face to face. Now, albeit in the, um, you know, the cone of silence, they're face to face in a plastic bubble. But, um, you know, this is how the movies depict work. And it's always a collaboration, always people talking together. And so how do you create that same thing where you have uh, people in a room and people remote? So cut the room in half. How do you make that happen? Now that was a challenge. And so um, what I'm gonna do now is um, uh, show you, uh, this is uh, the same technology that I used for the whiteboards in, at Shorelight. Um, this is where uh, people are actually at the wall, they're, in, they're standing. Uh, those screens can be, uh, th those screens can be data, they can be people. Uh, people can talk to each other and see each other. 
Uh, this uses a projection system, uh, but we now do it with touch screens. Uh, it's a technology from a company called Hoilu that I've helped develop, so full disclosure. Um, but it has multiple screens and multiple, you can add a number of screens. This happens to be four, uh, four screen solution, but I've seen uh, 10, 12 screen solutions. Uh, a lot of architects are using it for collaboration. Uh, for example, Skanska, uh, the large uh, uh, Swedish um, uh, construction company was building LaGuardia Airport. They had systems like this in their main offices. And they also had systems set up on site and then other people were joining from iPads and other devices. And they all collaborate, look at drawings together, annotate them, bring in BIM objects with video capability on it. What you can't see in this picture is on the other wall, uh, this is a complete surround, I wish I'd done it, but the other wall behind them is, all, is screens. So the people are behind them in screens, these are interactive touch, it's all part of the same experience. Um, and uh, so I'm now looking at how I do that for real. And uh, so this is a room uh, here at Gateway, and uh, I can actually take you over there um, uh, remotely, and I'm going to uh, switch over to a wireless mic and walk in that room to show you how that room really works. So bear with me. Um, so I'm doing this on a, uh, a I'm going to use a, um, uh, so the uh, microphone won't be quite as good, I heard, uh, but uh, we'll try it anyway. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me. And I'm going to flip my audio so I can hear you on a uh, IFB here. And drop and, your screen share, please, Greg. And I will drop my screen share. And hopefully you can hear me now on this. Yes, and, we can hear you fine. And I'm going to drop my screen share. And I am going to switch my camera here because naturally I have a video switcher in front of this. And this is now a, um, uh, I'm on a um, uh, stabilized camera here, and we are now going to go for a little walk uh, at, this, at the Swedish American Chamber. You're seeing that fine? We're seeing fine, and I'm going to ask people as you walk, please, please, we're going to put up, uh, Greg is giving us multiple video feeds, and so we're going to ask you to please be sure to switch your Zoom viewing window into speaker mode and uh, you'll be seeing multiple spotlighted windows these are all live feeds that we see on the left this is greg's walking camera he has an iphone on a stabilizer and he'll explain it further and he's walking into another room and uh somebody uh, in that room so we'll go into this one <laughs> all right so this is the uh, gateway center that he works in in midtown manhattan yep hi lauren i feel like i'm in the cigarette video review in 1992 as hdtv and the quest for virtual reality we've arrived go ahead greg you're live and we see uh, just the one window uh jeff okay so you can hear me now in here? Yes, we can. Okay. So I've now switched over to uh, the boardroom. And um, this is, I, so your one camera, the, my, my iPhone, as you can see, this is Greg Harper, so you can see what I'm looking at. And so I'm sitting in a room uh, that has a, that, that's a, this is a 16 foot uh, Unicy wall uh, that is uh, being used uh, with multiple cameras. and. Uh, there's Sennheiser ceiling microphones on here, and, and I'm not talking here. There's no operator here. This is all, it's all happening automatically. I'm speaking, and as you can see, the system detected where I can sit, where I'm sitting. And if I move, uh, for example, to the whiteboard, uh, it will figure out that I am at the whiteboard and automatically switch to me at the whiteboard, and I can use that. And of course, I can do image capture off that. Or if I come down to the end of the room here, I am at the... Um, I can be at uh, uh, the, the table here. Uh, so it's, uh, there, there are actually uh, seven cameras in here, although right now we're only using three of them. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, now, uh, somebody turned off my monitor. Uh, so hopefully this will come back on again. Um, and um, there is a monitor in the back of the room. Uh, it's another one of my touch screens that I use for the business learning. So if I come over here, so there is a monitor back here uh, because when somebody is looking at 
when somebody's talking to me remotely, um, I don't want my back. Uh, if I'm, you know, if they're talking to me, I don't want my back to the screen. So there is, a, they can see, still see everybody on the screen over here. Um, the uh, cameras are, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, if you look up here, you'll see the Sennheiser microphones. Uh, these are used uh, for uh, tracking. Now, these are interesting microphones because not only do they sound half decent, and uh, even though I, had, I do have a wireless mic on, I'm not using it, I'm using the Sennheiser in here. Um, they will give you uh, about three degrees of the uh, resolution and they know where I'm sitting and uh, it knows horizontal and vertical as well. So it can automatically pick that in. And so what's happening is these commands are being sent to a processor in the back room that are auto is automatically switching between uh, the different um, uh, systems. So it is uh, switching with the cameras and it says, oh, okay, he's in front of the room and this is the best shot. And it's using a combination of AI and, and, uh, uh, and uh, basically uh, pretty sophisticated audio processing to decide what shot to give me. Uh, obviously, if I have multiple people speaking, it'll switch back and forth and I'll know if, if you start to speak, it'll go to a wide shot uh, so you can see what's happening. So I can see the context of the room, which is of course a big problem, the context of the room. As I'm in this big room, you can see it's big room because of the, um, because I have my iPhone in here, but what do you, how are we gonna make that um, work for others? So uh, what we have done is we're experimenting with uh, some other capabilities. One of those is the, um, uh, for example, if I switch cameras here, uh, you will see that I have, yeah, it happened. Uh, yes, I, I, I asked the bar room, you can see, I've put a banner at the bottom and um, uh, what you're seeing is the, rest of the table. Now, I don't like the camera positioning, so I'm gonna put them on the side of the room. So right now those cameras are at the end of the room, but I'm trying to get it so it gives me the, uh, the whole width of the space. Um, and that's uh, give me an idea so I can see everybody in the room. And now with some of the new technology that's coming out from Zoom and Teams, uh, where I can do um, uh, the smart gallery, I'll be able to slice those camera shots into individual shots and actually they'll show up as multiple windows on your screen, which I'll show you in a few seconds. Um, so that's why I'm gonna move the cameras to the location. Uh, obviously I can share um, screens here. I can do whatever I want to do on that. It works uh, pretty nicely. The, uh, if you're interested in the technology here, uh, I'll go grab my iPhone. And uh, of course the screen in the back is can also be a whiteboard, uh, a digital whiteboard that I can use for sharing. Um, the cameras, um, if, uh, so these are the cameras that are doing the side shots. Um, and they're one on top of each other, 1080p cameras. Uh, the three cameras that are doing all the switching right now are these right here, and they're automatically switching. And then there is another set of two cameras over here. And those cameras will be moved under the side wall as soon as they get a chance to do so. Um, and now, uh, I think the other room is probably uh, is probably uh, still being used. So if that's the case, I will I'll just mute in and So don't adjust now, your but... sets. Greg is switching audio feeds, audio mics. I switched back here and um, it looks like there is somebody in the other room. Um, I'll just peek in here and just show you quickly. <laughs> so um, there's obviously a meeting going on in there. So I'm not going to interrupt it. Oh, there's, we also have just other sections here, other Zoom rooms here. Let me, uh,
Is that a D10 that you have there yes. in the corner? Yeah. And we've returned to your laboratory. Return to my laboratory and I'll switch back to here and I will switch my audio here if you don't mind for a second so I can hear you better. Okay. So you should be able to hear me now? Yes, we hear you five okay. by five. Okay, great. So I'm back in my lab. And uh, so you got a little tour. Unfortunately, the room that you're seeing in the slide uh, here is, is, not, um, is not happening. Uh, I showed you before, there are people in there, but you get the idea. That's a 1.2 mil LED wall. Uh, it's driven by a Barco E2. And uh, I can do Teams or, or Zoom or uh, content share. I've got a lot of options in that space. But what I want to show you next is uh, the whole, whole concept of puddles. So I'm going to switch over to this shot here. And what you're seeing is um, a, a huddle thing. Uh, just so you can get that into perspective, um, this is on uh, my table. So it's a, it's a, uh, a, a 360 camera. Um, but what's interesting about this, so I'm going to go back to the tight shot here so you can see it. Um, and I'm going to switch to the feed from that camera just so you can see how that works. Uh, because it is, uh, let's see, it's camera six, I believe. So um, this is the feed from this camera. And if I come over here and uh, sit down, notice it's auto framing and you can still hear me, right? Just wanna make sure I'm still okay. We hear you fine, yeah. Okay, okay. So you notice it auto framed um, and it, all four pictures here, again, it's all using uh, visual audio and video. Uh, so it's, it's analyzing the video and framing me, and it is giving the same picture. Now, obviously, what I would see on the screen here would be you guys, but for, your for this demonstration, I thought I'd just show you what the other remote site would see. Now, I can also put it into a wide mode, and so in this case, you're seeing one half of the room and the other half of the room, so the two halves of the rooms are here. Or I can go into this mode here, where if two people are speaking, one will be highlighted there, and if someone were in the other chair, they'd be speaking back and forth. And it's automatically slicing the people out of the picture and putting them into this. And then uh, there's even a mode where I could do four of those and I could have four. And what Zoom and other people are working on are the same idea, except there'll be many, many more windows um, that will happen in the Zoom room capability. So this is sort of an interesting concept. Um, so this is a effectively uh, 8K camera. Uh, so there's 4K on both sides, uh, opening basically a pixel map and it actually slices the people out of them and puts them on here and gives them an individual feeds. What's nice is this thing also will do Teams or PECSIP or um, you know, uh, Google Meet or whatever you want to do. It's not, it's not locked. It's totally self-contained. So it's four little screens. So just, these are just 20-some um, in, uh, inch uh, touch screens. And there's a distribution amplifier that distributes it. But the whole, everything is included in this, central, in this box in the middle that running, it's running it. So um, I'm going to now um, uh, switch over to talk about some of the other ideas that I'm working on. Uh, remember, I was telling you about how I wanted to um, uh, go with a mode which is more oriented toward, um, uh, let's go back here to camera one, and we're going to go to uh, camera selection here and camera selection here, and pretty shot shot. So notice on the wall here, there, is, um, uh, there are a series of monitors up there. That's a Zoom room up there. So if I go into a meeting with Zoom room, uh, and I won't, uh, try, I won't make you join my extra room here, uh, that now gives me uh, the ability to um, uh, a Zoom room capability. Um, and so what no, you've noticed, I put the screens, let's see, uh, hang on, done. I put the screens high up. Uh, the idea behind that is if I'm sitting here um, and I'm sitting uh, over here um, and, I'm, uh, and you're looking at me across the table, what you're seeing is, um, what you're looking at is me and above my head are the remote participants. Uh, so I have an eye contact, but by the same token, this is also set up so that the same monitors are reflected on the other side. 
So uh, to just to show you that, and I'll just use my, my little uh, capability here to show you. So there are monitors on the left, but there are also monitors on the right, and they're duplicate of each other. And in the middle are uh, both sharing and touchscreens. So I have touchscreen capability, all part of the same experience. So now I've got an inclusive. So I've got screens on the left, screens on the right that are duplicate. And then I can go over here and I have my interactive whiteboard that I can go in and, uh, and you know, draw away if I want, whatever I want to do here. And that's all shared. So again, uh, uh, the combination of these things, and I've actually also combined what's in the center with what's on the outside here, but I won't go into that right now. So this is one way of looking at how uh, to actually create the in inclusiveness, because I don't want to have anybody having their back to the camera. I'm going to switch back over here to this. Um, so the second thing I want to show you, or not second thing, another thing I want to show you is the whole concept of um, uh, putting people in that don't move around on the page. Because one of the big problems with Zoom and Teams is people tend to, when at, depending on you, where you are on the screen, depends on when you join. And if someone goes away, people start moving around. It's very hard to keep, go keep track of what's going on. So um, that doesn't work so well if you're trying to um, uh, really uh, interact with people. You want to know whether they're there or not there. So one of the things we've done is, and I will just now call up a browser here and uh, set up a system here. You know, it'll take me a few seconds here. It's all virtual. And uh, I'm going to select my classroom and I'm gonna start the session. And okay, so what's happening now is commands are being sent uh, to the, um, uh, to the cloud, and it's going to uh, camera four here. It's going to these nooks uh, and uh, old Dante stuff that I'll tell you about in a second. And let's go back over here. And now if I go over here, those positions are individual students. They're all WebRTC applications. They're all, they're all running at WebRTC. So you just need a browser to be able to connect to it. And uh, those positions I control and I can control them remotely. I can group them. I can bring people into, I can move people any, any tile I want. The audio is all mixed together in, uh, in Dante uh, uh, through the BiAmp processor here. Um, and um, I now have the ability to actually put cameras. And if you notice on the upper right-hand corner, you'll see there are little cameras up there. Uh, so I can have a camera for each of the tiles. So when I'm looking at the person at the other end and I look at that tile, they will see me looking at them. Just plain old webcams work for that. So I'm trying a number of different things, Panacast, uh, regular, regular PTZ cameras, et cetera. But there are a lot of different cameras doing that. This system is, uh, was originally developed for the Harvard. Um, and it was for their Harvard Business School. Uh, they, of course, uh, did it the Harvard way, and so they use the same technology, but they uh, spent a lot more money than I did on it and um, uh, have a few more screens than I do. But it's the same technology, and I can just add more screens if I had more physical space and more nooks. Uh, so each one of those little nooks uh, controls, um, each one of these little nooks here uh, controls uh, one tile. So if I look over here, um, so... This nook is controlling the upper left, middle, uh, middle one, upper, uh, far right, and so on and so forth. The three at the bottom, one's a cam camera manager. One is the- Sorry, controls. Greg, we, we're seeing only your back. Sorry, because I'm standing in front of the camera, probably. That would explain it, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so these, these, that are, again? The, these are the, uh, that, 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 there is something about having a director that can switch these things and adjust audio. It has some advantage. Uh, but anyway, uh, these are the three, these are the tiles. These are the nooks that control the tiles. If I wanted more, I just add more nooks. Um, and then these are, this is the tile, this one uh, actually controls uh, uh, sharing. Uh, so there's more screens on the ground here, uh, camera manager, and then there's a master that keeps everything running together. It all runs um, uh, up here on this switch here. Uh, the red, uh, ca the, the green cable is, is all the Dante. Uh, so the Dante audio is all going into the BiAmp, and these other ones are the data feeds going to the various nooks. 
And then there's some pretty sophisticated stuff running around in there to manage the audio so it doesn't uh, go all over the place. Uh, all right. Um, so just, uh, you know, for the rest of the lab, just if you want to get an eye, I know this is now uh, close to the time when we're supposed to uh, move away uh, to question and answer, but I will cut over back over to five here, which is my can here. And I'll show you the rest of the lab. Uh, this obviously is my desk. Um, and as you can see, I have a, a black magic switcher here. And, um, but over here, there is a full production system. Um, so this controls uh, the uh, cameras that are also in the event space. So for example, if I uh, look at camera seven here, uh, that is the event space here at, uh, at Gateway. And I have, it's all NDI and I can control it any way I like. Um, there, so there's a switcher here with various uh, shots and different things I can do over here. Um, and all the switching, uh, camera control, a lot of black magic stuff, um, uh, Yamaha for the audio, it's all Dante. Uh, this system over here has nothing to do with what I was talking about, but it's interesting anyway. Um, this is a, a command and control system. Uh, that big screen that I was using in the boardroom can also be turned into a command and control screen. This used by Homeland Security and uh, police departments, et cetera, so we can look and monitor a lot of different things. Uh, it's all another video over IP. And then obviously lots of toys to play with, um, portable podcast studio, and then just electronics, as you can imagine, there's a lot of stuff here that is around. These are the, those are the screens around the floor for testing. Um, and there's even a uh, broadcast camera here. Uh, there are three of these here for when I do events here, uh, broadcast camera. So I think we're hit the one hour and one hour mark. So I will now uh, open it up for questions. Oh, actually just one thing before we do that, I wanna share two more shots, actually three more shots before I go. Um, so I'm gonna go back to sharing here. Uh, let me see, where are we here? And I'm gonna go to sharing. Uh, I wanna show you a couple of other things. So I'm not the only one thinking about this, obviously. Uh, so Greg, you'll probably wanna switch your camera feed Yep, I will in a second. And we're not yet seeing the share on the slides. You're not because I have to fire it up again. <laughs> That's why. So we're gonna switch the camera feed to camera three and we are going to go to share. Um, so here is the share screen and uh, here is share. And now you should be, oh, did I get it? Did I get it right? No, I got it. Uh, you need to go to your PowerPoint now. Yeah, I know, sorry. Uh, stop share, I wanna go to share screen and I wanna share the PowerPoint. So that would be better than sharing this other thing. Okay, so now you should be seeing um, uh, something that Google's working on. Uh, it's called Campfire, same idea, 360 camera. Uh, and things are, are all in uh, surrounded here. Um, there is a, um, uh, let's see if we can get out here. Uh, this is what MasterCard is doing. Uh, they actually came up and looked at this um, and uh, they came up, this is their version of it. Um, so it's the same uh, control, same cameras I had for the other one. Um, this is interesting. This is Google Starline. Uh, this is 3D. Um, and what this is doing is actually looking at uh, light field cameras uh, to get a 3D image. And then you're looking at it in a 3D glasses free uh, display. Um, it's still prototype, it's still early on, but it has some interest. And of course, because I am interested in that, I have looked at doing something similar. And that is a 3D display. You can't tell it's 3D but that is a 3D display on my desk there uh, that um, uh, uh, experiment, a light field type display uh, that can take things. Uh, unfortunately, the big problem here is graphics cards. We're having trouble with them. And then um, um, uh, here's another example. Uh, this is what um, uh, on the far right is what PNG is doing. They're using projectors to get a, a wide view. Uh, again, the same idea over the head. Uh, I, artist concepts of of screens on the side and large, large screens in the front. 
And uh, this is an example that I use the uh, system that uh, you just saw behind me um, in a TV studio uh, to do bring in remote audience and whoever was speaking would automatically be brought in onto a teleprompter so the host could actually interact with anybody individually on the show. So with that, I now will turn it over to questions. I would have two questions if I'm allowed. You are certainly allowed, Case the lot. So uh, thanks for this great presentation of yet another huge, uh, 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 what is it, pile of uh, gadgets uh, bound together to make this uh, uh, distributed and remote classroom uh, systems. But I have a question. So you put, you throw a lot of technology at, uh, at the teacher, but the teacher has to teach not to be engaged with the technology. Absolutely. It should just work. So you <laughs> used as an example in, uh, in network uh, graphs or uh, routing or so, internet uh, professor, would a uh, uh, law professor also be able to use it? Yeah. In our, in our uh, university, the law professors uh, don't know anything about technology. Yeah? And uh, Greg, could by, you by the way, the engineer. Greg, could you please switch your camera? Greg, we're yeah. looking at the 3D display rather than your face. Thank yeah, you. The, 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 the engineering professors don't either, by the way. Um, uh, so no, they, they need about uh, 10 minutes worth of training and they do nothing. It's all automated. They don't have to do anything. There's only a teaching assistant in the, in the studio and a professor walks in and um, his courses or her courses are on the Ucommons. They simply say, start the lecture or start the program and whatever they put in, that's what pops up and it will sequence through everything. So it, um, there is a teaching assistant there to, to help them. But in many times, uh, because we're doing courses into Asia, uh, uh, they, they, start, they tend to start very early in the morning and sometimes the professor gets there before the, uh, the teaching assistant and they just uh, walk in, uh, the studio is all running, they just start talking and teaching. Uh, they don't have to put a microphone on, they don't have to know anything, all they have to do is teach. Yeah, so my second question is the following. So what I have learned from this uh, 18 months of uh, sitting at home mostly or uh, not being able to travel and to meet uh, uh, all of you uh, wonderful friends uh, is that uh, organized Zoom meetings don't create creativity. Uh, people just go along the agenda. Well, since a month I'm going back to the university again, the university opened up and so on. And then immediately you see the creativity ray, uh, rise because you meet people at, uh, at the um, uh, coffee machine and so on. And actually there's more creativity in the accidental meetings than in the planned meetings. Yes. How do you see that? How can technology help us? Because I feel that we currently have a problem with COVID, but we will soon roll into another problem, which is climate change. And that will also limit our yeah. movement. So uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the, the serendipitous uh, discussions are, are, are very real. So uh, again, back into the banking world, uh, we have created water cooler systems that are on all the time. Uh, There's not a Zoom meeting. Uh, it's basically a screen and a camera by the water cooler, and they're connected to multiple locations. And, you know, most of the time there's nothing on them. Someone comes up there and starts talking and seeing something else. Uh, the system I showed you at the very beginning, that's on all the time. The, uh, mm -hmm. the, the staff can walk in anytime and have a meeting. So it's not a Zoom. So Zoom definitely uh, does create some of that uh, order uh, to the meetings. Uh, but uh, when you look at the uh, the magic is really, uh, that's why I showed you the system uh, behind me. Um, uh, the audio mixing uh, was very important uh, because if you just let Zoom do the mixing and five or six people talk, it ends up being uh, just a craziness. Whereas in this particular case, all of those people remotely are all communicating. They can commute. I can, I can let the, just the group of the people in one tile talk to each other and I can monitor it here, but they can talk amongst themselves in every tile, every group of tiles. And I can move people from group to group, or they can move from group to group. So they can have little subgroups and breakouts, but their professor is still seeing them at all times. So that's, that's why the audio is so sophisticated with the, uh, the Dante, because we're actually mixing that. We're not doing that in the cloud. It's actually coming back. WebRTC feeds are coming into that little nook, and then we are spreading it, sp spitting it out as, uh, as, um, as Dante, and then we're managing those channels. 
And so now I can point to any one of those tiles and let those guys talk amongst themselves. And, uh, and I'm now listening to six conversations, not 36, but the people in each conversation can have their own conversation. So there are tricks you can do to make it, whether it's a on always screen or whatever. Um, and, uh, but we're still experimenting. We don't have the answer to it all yet, but I, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you hundred percent. We have also seen interesting experiments with virtual conferences where they yeah. also created these spaces where you virtually could come close to somebody, understand them, and then virtually walk to somebody else's avatar and so on. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's exactly what's happening here. So these, in this particular case, each one of those tiles, each one of those little faces, they're individual, but I put them into not rooms, I put them into, well, tiles, I call it, yeah, they're called tiles, but I put them in those tiles and so they can talk and I can put two in one or I can put six in other. So for example, uh, you know, when I showed you that picture before of the, of the, t of the t talk show that we put people with a common issue talking amongst themselves, not affecting the rest. I'd like to move on to the next question and uh, who would like to raise their hand? So I'll, I'll ask a question, Lauren, and I asked it yesterday um, for that audience, but I think it bears repeating, um, especially for us in the you know, university setting, um, you know, we're always hoping to, to lean forward into technology, but always sort of concerned about cost and resources. Yes. Could you um, just sort of give us a, a ballpark overview of how much something like your gateway conference room would cost, the little desktop setup you have, um, and maybe some other uh, the things that you've highlighted today. So we get a sense of, of what those uh, budgets might look like. Okay. So the, uh, we'll start with the, the least expensive one, which is my little huddle thing on the, um, on, on the, on the, on the conference table. Let's see uh, where, where this little thing here. Um, so each one of those screens is a, uh, uh, Amazon about 350 bucks, 400 bucks each. Um, so that's uh, uh, four of them, so 1600 bucks. And the, uh, the, the, the camera microphone solution, it's all in one, including the thing, that's $1,000. So $2,600 as a distribution amplifier. And uh, that's pretty much it. So that, that whole thing is uh, under $4,000. Um, uh, the monitors have their own little stands. Uh, they're actually 4K monitors. Um, so it's... Uh, you know, four times, let's say $400 each. So that's uh, $1,600 for the screens, thousand bucks for the uh, for the camera system and a few hundred bucks for the peripheral stuff. So that's the least expensive. The um, the next level is the uh, the boardroom. Uh, so the boardroom, um, the uh, that's a little bit more expensive but that's more in the $70,000 $70, range than the multi-million dollar range. Um, but that does not include the cost of the screen because the screen itself is uh, that that's a 16 foot uh, 8k screen uh, you don't have to do that you can it'll, it'll work just as fine with plain old uh, monitors uh, but the um, the processor and uh, the, the first three cameras that's about uh, 15 seventeen thousand dollars each additional camera is another three thousand dollars plus the microphones are uh, about uh, four thousand dollars each and then there's a the, the QSC processing and switching and all the rest. So it, the whole thing, you could build that whole room for about $70,000. The LED room, LED wall room, which, I, which where people are having lunch in that I, unfortunately that I can't show you, uh, couldn't show you directly. That's a lot more expensive because that wall by itself is you know, $400,000. And, the, um, and then you're adding in the, the processor and then all the electronics on top of that. So that's probably a close to a half million dollar room. Uh, so that gives you a range. Uh, in terms of the distance learning studios, um, I've, I've got uh, three flavors of studio. I've got the home studio, which is a couple of thousand dollars, which is two screens, uh, two touch screens. Uh, so it, all in all, by the time you add the microphone, the cameras, and all the rest, it's probably about 4,000 bucks for the home studio. Uh, single screen version is only um, $2,000. Uh, then I have the what I'm calling the pod studio, and that's about an $80,000 hit. And that's the teleprompter, the touch screens, and everything else, but no control room. And then I have the full studio, uh, which is about $140,000, $150,000. So it gives you an idea of what they are. Thanks, Greg. And you're still on the camera for the um, desktop thing. Uh, you can you see know, the tiny that, in one that, little the, corner. That's, that's, what, that's why you want a, a director, right? 
Uh, or or the the automated thing that just switches to where the audio comes. <laughs> yeah, there there is there actually is a Sennheiser system in here, um, and I actually could drive the switcher, but um, I haven't done it yet. So maybe I'll do that next. Well, uh, let's take some more questions. Maxine. Well, okay, uh, not so much a question um, as a comment. I really liked uh, Greg's story about how the professor shows up in person and nobody cared, <laughs> basically. They just went back to their mode of, of working. And we had a fun story about, um, so Sage 3 has a new collaborator, Chris North at Virginia Tech. And uh, since we're still in our alpha version of Sage 3, he hadn't installed it yet. So after a year of teaching remotely, the students show back up in class and Greg would be happy to know that after they looked at him, they started using Zoom on their laptops, even though they could see him whatever he was doing on the board. And so he, he noticed this and he said, what are you doing? You don't need Zoom. And they said, well, we can share information and see each other's faces. <laughs> and so he said, I got to I got to install Sage 3 now. It's like I got to I got to get these kids up. So um, I do. I mean, I th thought your talk was great. I think that um, it, it, it's cost for academics. I agree with Jeff. There is an issue. Um, but it would be so nice, you know, you're doing things in hardware that w is our dream in software. So that's, it, it was yeah. really exceptional. We can't, we can't do it all yet, but that's a goal. Yeah, my, my, my programming skills are not good enough to do the software and software, but I agree that the future is going to be edge devices. Uh, you still need cameras, microphones, speakers, and screens, but all of the processing, all of the logic, there's not going to be PTZ cameras. It's all going to be in software. Um, and that's, I mean, that's exactly what's happening with that little thing on my desk. I mean, that's all in software. Um, there, all of that switching, all of that uh, de detection, uh, uh, splitting the screen, all the rest, that's all software control. Uh, there is no mechanical stuff there. So it's one 360 camera, it's actually two 4K cameras back to back that are dumping an image into a um, image map and then it, uh, using dewarping software that dewarps it. Uh, and uh, there you go. And then after that, it's all uh, art, you know, recognition, et cetera. Um, uh, the biggest challenge we have right now, quite frankly, that I'm running into is uh, availability of GPUs. Um, really hard to get, as you know. Um, what I, what I Devin showed you, I mean, what I'm working on now um, is um, uh, using uh, some of the gaming platforms and Unreal Engine, et cetera, and um, looking at what's happening. You know, so I, I have the, of course, I have the, you know, the latest PlayStation and Xbox uh, to see what the graphics power of that is. But when you think about it, if I now have the, the notion of a 16 by nine wall, a 16 by nine screen is just foreign to me. It's, it's basically I have a pixel map and I then have to have a certain number of process, uh, a certain number of GPU power to be able to drive that. And then what actually controls that? And the idea of pre-canned content that is just plays. If I'm, if I'm doing a, for example, if I'm doing a, a display in a, in a lobby, uh, I, I, and people come in every single day. I can't have the same display every day. And I, I can't go and spend millions of dollars to produce something uh, worthy of a James Cameron movie. And even that is only two hours worth of stuff or three hours worth of stuff. I need something that's 24 hours, 365 days a year. The only way I'm going to make that happen is if I use uh, real-time generated content that's being affected by traffic, stock market, uh, weather, uh, uh, other things like that. And as if you, if you have a chance, you might want to take a look. Uh, go to Dallas uh, if you anywhere near Dallas, and go see the new AT and T Park, uh, which is a really interesting example of. They have a very large 100 foot LED wall outdoors, but they also have uh, all kinds of other audio and, and and physical things that are there, and it's all running 24 seven. And it is, it's constantly changing based on everything from the wind to the number of people in the, in the plaza to the interactivity. It's a very interesting uh, installation. And I think that is what we're gonna see more and more of. 
and uh, we're going to see more and more of it. You know, the sky server and things of that nature. Uh, there, there's a, there's a lot going on. Uh, that's just beginning to do that. We're going to see virtual backgrounds instead of doing green screen. We're going to be, it's all going to be digital in the background. So Greg, I can probably speak pretty confidently for the um, computational media department at UC Santa Cruz, which is my academic home, and say, if you want to partner on developing some of this content, we're standing by to help. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you got eager graduate students and as you know, very capable faculty, and we would love to partner with you. Um, I, I did have a question on chat, um, and it came from Cindy Miller. She's a colleague at UC Santa Cruz, and it's kind of a human factors question. And she wants to know how the office staff feel about being on camera all the time, or is it just sort of an understood thing in this environment that, that cameras are everywhere? Well, um, at, at the bank, we were actually experimenting with Zoom before COVID happened. We had, uh, you know, so limited number of people testing it. So when COVID happened, everyone went to Zoom. And at the beginning, it was like, oh, I was only doing this for two or three months. And uh, well, we'll be okay with it. And, uh, you know, we'll go back to normal. Uh, when it dragged out the longer and longer, and people came more and more used to it, and they started, well, you know, it's not so bad. I'm not commuting. I'm having actually better conversations. I'm actually working with the team members that I normally wouldn't work with. Uh, and uh, it, it's different. Yes. Uh, but uh, I have found that most people have accepted it extremely well. And um, uh, it, it really is, um, uh, it really is fascinating. Uh, it's, a, it's a psychology project. I didn't study technology, by the way, in university college. I studied psychology and theater. Um, so um, it really, at the end of the day, you know, the technology is enabler, but it has to be invisible. I mean, to the comment was made before, it, it's got to be behind the scenes. You, you got to walk in and just do it. Um, and having uh, the facility here at Gateway, where I have people that are absolutely not technical, uh, that are walking in rooms and doing meetings and all the rest, uh, it's really fascinating to look and see how it's being done. And because we have a lot of different companies here, what we're seeing is a lot of different perspectives on that. A lot of people looking at things differently. Um, but it's also about UI. It's about how you, it, it, it's, ex, it's experiential design. It's XD at the end of the day. You really have to think about experience. And uh, the technology really should be taking a back seat to this. Unfortunately, you know, I still have to plug wires together and put boxes together, but hopefully not for long. So it just reminds me of the uh, idea of the 17th century idea of the Bentham's Panopticon, um, which is, you know, one thing is seen uh, and it, it's just the reality we live in, right? Yeah, it, it, you know, you, you, when, you, when you live with something for a while, at first it's like, oh, it's jarring. But I have not been on an airplane since February of 20, uh, January of 2020. Uh, and for me, who have been on airplanes uh, normally two or three times a month, um, it was really jarring. And uh, uh, we have a house upstate New York. And uh, when the pandemic happened, we moved up the Adirondacks. I turned our guest cottage into uh, a full lab. And by the way, all this is replicated up there, believe it or not. And uh, the, um, uh, I found it much more, much more relaxing. I could actually do some thinking. I actually built a listening room in, in, my, in, my, in my facility uh, so I can just go in and put my feet up and uh, pull out vinyl. How about that? And uh, just listen to good classical music or, or jazz or something like that. A great, a great refresher to get your brain going. But then to walk into the lab and work on things. And I'm doing that in the middle of the Adirondack forest. Uh, that, you know, I didn't think that was possible. Uh, but we were able to do that. And uh, I think that the pandemic has made that possible. I'm now seriously wondering how much time I'm going to be spending in this facility versus upstate uh, versus traveling. Um, you know, our trade shows really is important anymore. Um, I, I've been invited to uh, uh, I've been invited to presentations now with a lot of major companies. Now, albeit I am a, a big consumer, as some of you know, of technology, so I do get uh, good interaction with with the companies I'm working with. But walking around a trade show floor. Uh, without eating, uh, uh, just basically um, uh, on, on, on my feet for 12 hours a day to see a new iPhone case, um, I'm getting a lot more out of the interactive stuff. So it's, it's different. It, it's different. And so uh, I'd like to jump in myself. Um, uh, uh, trade shows are not as valuable as they used to be, in my personal opinion. And that's been a trend that uh, uh, for several years, uh, because you can get so much on the web now, and uh, uh, the pandemic has just like, <clears throat> I'd hate to be in the trade show business going forward. 
yeah. but that's not really my question, Greg. I absolutely appreciate with you. Like most of us here, we've not we've had to change, and it was quite a jarring thing. Uh, I was traveling right up to like you know days before the pandemic shutdowns. My question is this: um, How do we handle hybrid? Hybrid to me is some of the people have returned to in-person interaction and some of the people are not, they're still remote. And that means that your huddle, I understand is trying to bridge this, but maybe face-to-face -face office interactions that's possible. But in my personal experience, uh, there are interactions that just extremely difficult. Either you focus on the people in front of you who are physically in front of you, which is natural, and you lose track of the people that are remote and they feel like they're just watching somebody else have a meeting or do the thing, or you're focused on the remote people and the people who came face to face are like, what am I, chopped liver? Why am I sitting here? Yeah. I could be home. I, I commuted three hours to get here. You know, so That's how do we handle that? Very, I find it very difficult you know, hard to get my head around it. What's your thinking? Well, my thinking is that um, we have to think about the physical design of the space. Um, and right now we still have rectangular conference rooms, rectangular tables, and we're not thinking like Google does about everybody sitting around at a campfire or uh, what uh, MasterCard is doing. Uh, I just built a room and I, I wish I could talk, show you about it, but <laughs> it's, it's soft seating. Everybody can see everybody else. There, there are screens everywhere on all sides, <coughs> cameras on all sides, and it's all automated switching. So the people remote and the people in the room are equally represented. And um, it's, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty sophisticated space, <coughs> excuse me. But at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's gonna be a combination of the architects, the experiential design folks, uh, and there's some very interesting stuff happening. Um, uh, Google is doing some very interesting stuff um, in uh, some of their, in their uh, uh, executive briefing centers uh, that, that they use the time in the pandemic to build them. They're doing a new peer here in New York and they're, they've built some very interesting software uh, that is going to allow for uh, interaction uh, <clears throat> that goes beyond. Um, everything from smart badges to uh, thinking of, a, of an event as being in multiple locations simultaneously with the same ability to ask questions, et cetera, whether you're in the audience or physically remote and the ability to have them all presented. It, it's gonna be different, uh, but it, if you don't really think about the architecture and don't think about uh, keeping everybody on an equal footing, it's gonna be a problem. And just to add, I, I like that when Greg was doing his big conference room table, you said you replicated the table and the size of the person at the table in all the remote sites. Because yep. we found at EVL that um, making you know a little uh, thumbnail on a laptop is not the same as taking you know a huge LCD and having that person's face at the table. Yeah, and Maxine, I mean, you know, at AVL, you also have that complete cave thing where you're in the room and everyone's around you. I mean, that, all of that's in, all of that has inspired me. So, uh, you know, thank you for your for your hospitality there. Uh, but it it really it really at the end of the day, it's not just the thumbnail, but it also it's got to have enough resolution. It's got to have the frame rate. If you don't do it, if you try to do it at 15 frames per second, it's not real time. So, you know, you, we've all seen Cameron's little demo of frame rate and uh, and what you know what happens when you go change from 24 up to 120 or higher. And you notice all the gamers are at, at the much higher rates, and all the new phones and 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 Macs that are that coming out are all at the higher frame rate. That makes a big difference. The frame rate has a huge difference. Uh, the AV industry, I'm, 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 I, I, I saw a notice to go by about Infocom. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the AV industry is, is on its way to oblivion. Um, it's being overtaken by uh, the IT industry. Um, uh, I've got all kinds of other personal reasons about why I don't want to go to Infocom, but um, it's, it, it doesn't, I don't see I'm going to learn anything there. Um, you, you need to, the AV guys are still stuck in their closed systems. Um, I didn't even talk about this, but uh, one of the big things I'm working on is AV over IP, 
um, and uh, using broadcast standards like 2110, IPMX, uh, NDI. So this whole facility here is running NDI, Dante, et cetera, of that nature. And I am absolutely looking at what happens when you start having collaboration uh, over IP. Um, and the NAV guys just don't get it. So if you think about IP, video over IP, you then think about uh, what's happening with the, um, uh, the world of architecture and how architecture is gonna to merge together. I think the architects have a huge opportunity here uh, to affect how we think and because architects are creating the spaces. Um, I, I was fortunate at one point to be on a panel with uh, an anthropologist and we were looking at the evolution of the family home. This was for a cable operator and uh, looked at uh, back from Pompeii all through the ages about how people's homes are laid out. And after World War I, that the Americans went over to Europe and they saw that they had kitchens and dining in their area separate and, and then uh, they had servants so everybody wanted the same thing. To now where uh, the kitchen and dining room and uh, living space are all one space. It's a, a cumulative space and people are knocking down walls. So we've learned by the way people interact to change the architecture. We haven't done that in the in the in the uh, corporate world in the education world. We're still rectangular rooms. We're still dealing with uh, rectangular tables. We're still putting a screen at the end of the room. Uh, that's why I'm experimenting with wall screens on the walls. That's why I'm doing things. Unfortunately, I can't knock the walls down here. But trust me, if I could knock down the walls of some of these rooms, I'd, they'd, they'd be coming down in milliseconds uh, because you have to think differently. And I'm not an architect, but you, you've got to think about those things. Otherwise. Um, you're not going to get that same uh, feeling of, of uh, inclusiveness. Right now, the architects think, oh, there are people in the room and there's somebody remote. Uh, they'll do part. And that's what creates what Lauren was saying, the have and have nots. That has to stop. Well, I think that's the, 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 the motto for this uh, uh, brilliant presentation yesterday and today was knock down those walls. And uh, <laughs> uh, just wonderful, Greg. And you've been so generous with uh, sharing with us and uh, 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 inspiring us. And uh, a good example, uh, like Maxine said, of, uh, you know, you saw Sage, uh, she sees you. Um, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're fulfilling our mission of uh, uh, cross-pollinating here. Uh, Michael Krizik has appeared. Uh, Michael, do you want to say anything? I know, I, I just, I just uh, kind of from listening, uh, it was, let me say, great. And um, I think we can learn something uh, on the other side of the ocean. <laughs> Lauren, can I ask a question about the future? Go. Greg, hi, Greg. Um, hey, Trish. You know, this whole thing about hybrid is really, we're all experiencing it probably. You, you all are professionals dealing with very high level things like television studios, classrooms, workspaces. And the rest of us are dealing with a lot of things we've done on Zoom, like I'm in the League of Women Voters, I'm in a film club at the Mechanics Institute, and all the groups I'm in are now moving into uh, physical space. And um, I am not always willing to move into that physical space with people yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered, I sort of, I remember back in the television industry, we had camera in a box. Remember the evolution from the very expensive cameras to the cheap things where people, now we have TikTok and people are doing things. So my question has to do, and Lauren asked about the, the psychological thing of people, but I'm wondering, do you foresee, and I guess we will foresee it, but when do you foresee uh, a hybrid a capability where people still will remain at home or in Indonesia where they want to come into the film club or wherever they are. Um, but it'll be, you know, it'll be in a box. Somebody at a particular organization would for probably under $2,000, I don't know if that's possible, you know, okay, now you're going to get these four, if your room is square, if you get this size, you get the four, for uh, mics and the, and the camera, you have to put the mic above and it can be set up in the, and I agree with you about architecture having to ch change, but until we have round rooms and we still have square rooms, will there, do, when do you foresee and how, and how do you, how feasible is this hybrid outside of these Harvard and uh, AT&T yeah. centers that have these great screens? Well, when the pandemic was hitting, um, uh, I'm, uh, I've been involved with the St. Bartholomew's Church on Park Avenue for decades. And um, uh, I had just been to DC and I was hearing from my brother-in-law who's at the NIH that uh, this pandemic was coming. And so I sort of said to them, you know, guys, you might want to think about it because you know, we not, it might not be able to have services. 
And I had a week and uh, put together a whole system. It basically saved them from, uh, uh, they had to shut down and they used my system. And uh, now there are people joining the church who are not even in New York City. It's expanded the thing. So in a Christmas service, for example, we would get maybe a couple thousand people. And all of a sudden we have you know 50,000 people. It, it's really amazing. But uh, they then came to me and said, okay, we're now going back to, back to church. And we now, but we still love this. Uh, what can you do? And so I built a, um, a, a rolling suitcase uh, with exactly what you said. It's got computers, cameras, and other things all built into it. And you just open the lid and the, 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 the screen is in the lid and then underneath it are the computers and everything else. And then uh, the uh, connect it to, um, it's got Wi-Fi built into it, et cetera. Uh, and it's effectively a multi-camera production system. Uh, uh, the <laughs> Alexa is talking to me. Uh, but then uh, there's another, um, another thing I'm working on is a, uh, Alexa, no. <laughs> um, the, other, the other thing that's going on is I've, I've, I've got another box. It's a little bit bigger. I've not got it down to 2000, but it's a, it's a square box. It has a teleprompter mirror in it. It's got a camera behind the teleprompter mirror. It's got a screen underneath it. So there's a screen a prompter mirror, camera behind it, uh, LED lights around the edge, microphones around the edge. And now you have that facial, direct face-to-face -face contact. You just uh, handle the top, stick it on the table and turn it on. And there it is for a single, not for the whole room. But that uh, the LEDs around the side will give you the lighting. Uh, the teleprompter will give you the eye contact. The camera's behind it. Um, and then there's speakers, of course, into the system. And all you have to, it's Wi-Fi, and I even thought about making it battery powered uh, so that you just turn it on and off it goes. Um, but uh, it, it's, I haven't gotten it down to $2,000, but um, absolutely uh, within the realm of possibility. Um, and, and do you see people coming into this space already? I mean, it's such a business opportunity. Yeah. I, yeah, it's it's the same it's the same problem. The AV industry, I don't think, has gotten it yet. Uh, they still want to sell you the the Crestron system. They still want to sell you the Kramer or the whatever it is. Uh, they still want to sell you the prepackaged rooms. Uh, but I'm seeing more and more people uh, doing what I just did here. They, they, you know, Black Magic with their little three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars switcher has changed everything. They're selling hundreds of thousands of these things. These used to be you know, production switcher was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now they're five hundred bucks and they sell hundreds of thousands of them. Um, so um, uh, you're seeing that. And the gaming industry is, is a big driver of that. Um, and uh, you're seeing uh, all kinds of uh, people working on that. Uh, you know, the ring light was something that only, you know, fashion models use. Now you can buy them on, a on Amazon for next to nothing and they sell thousands and thousands every day uh, to get the lighting. Um, so uh, these industries are springing up. And uh, I don't know if the traditional guys are going to do it or not. I, I feel sorry for some of the traditional guys because they're so stuck in their model that they don't see the change coming. But it's, it's dramatic. And I think the pandemic just accelerated everything. Um, is it was going to happen anyway? It was going, to, but it was going to take over seven, eight years. And the pandemic just forced everything to the to the forefront, and it happened very, very quickly. And I'm not sure everybody's caught up yet, but I'm sure there are people doing it. Thank you very much, Greg, and thank you, Tricia, for that really good question. Uh, we are over time, and I want to let Greg, who Alexa is reminding him he has his next meeting in a few minutes, and everybody else has a calendar and a schedule. I want to thank Greg once again for uh, another brilliant tour de force. Thank uh, you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, within uh, maybe a week or two, uh, we'll have posted the best hits recorded compilation of Greg's uh, presentations from yesterday and today, and we'll post that to the Cinegrid Forum archive, uh, which runs on YouTube, and you can all check it out. And Greg uh, will uh, share his slides uh, uh, with us as well, which we'll make available. And, and one thing, Lauren, uh, Jeff asked me about toys and how many cell phones I had. I didn't have it ready. I do have the, 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 the folding phone, but I also have something I thought was kind of fun. This is a working cell phone. No. <laughs> Back to the night. Do you have uh, your mini me version of you as well to run around uh, carrying it? <laughs> that is a that is a working cell phone. Oh, well, thank you, Greg, uh, and thank you everybody for staying with us uh, through this uh, uh, session. 
Uh, we'll see you in December 7th and 8th for uh, digital uh, audio driven by AI for gaming and movies. Have a good day.